Okay, good morning. So we spend, as you have seen, a fair amount of time in this class taking integrals by hand. And I mean, I, I sort of understand why we do it. It's sort of based on the theory that someone who passes undergrad calculus should be able, well, undergraduate, who gets an undergraduate degree should be able to go on to grad school and do kind of theoretical stuff. But it's not a very accurate picture of how math is done in most real world settings. I mean, in most real world settings, if you want an integral from A to B of f of x dx, you are not going to be sitting there and messing around with parts or trigonometric substitution or something. You're going to numerically <laughs> estimate it. And this is especially true because most integrals cannot be taken by hand. <laughs> Again, I understand why the textbook doesn't want to dwell on this, but it is the easiest thing in the world to create integrals that you cannot compute using any of the methods we've discussed in this class. And I'm not talking about, you know, super, super abstract integrals that are grown in a lab not to work well. I mean, very common integrals. Like you see, not this exactly, but you see something like the second integral as a major definition in the probability. And you just cannot compute it using parts or U substitution or anything like that. So, if we can't compute the integral by hand, but we need it, what are our options? Well, we have a few in kind of super abstract settings. There are ways to approach these integrals. You can say, okay, well, we'll we'll rewrite these as infinite sums and then we'll integrate. And I mean, there, there's a time and a place for that, but again, the time and the place is probably not a doctor's office, for example. So we need to talk about numerical estimation. And it's a sort of, it, this is true for a fair amount of undergrad math, I think, that the amount of space it's given in the textbook does not represent how important it is. Again, because this is just one section of the textbook, but it's how most integrals, I think, are taken in the real world. Of course, in the real world, this is basically a black box algorithm. You have your whatever system you're using and you tell it, take an integral and it gives you an integral rounded to 16 decimal places or whatever. And you don't have to know what's going on under the hood. But we as math people, <laughs> will answer the question, what's going on under the hood? And there are three rules presented in the textbook 
in practice, probably two of those get used really often, and the third gets used less often, but... <laughs> we'll start with the rule that I think tends to get used less often. Um, it's slower than the competition, and it lacks um, it lacks the ability to do some things that we'll see we can do with the so-called trapezoidal rule. But what the midpoint rule is, which is nice, is that it's really easy to understand. The midpoint rule says. Well, way back when we were starting all of this, before we talked about the fundamental theorem or anything like that, before we understood that integrals were related to antiderivatives, how did we approximate the area under this curve? The answer is that we shot the curve up into pieces, and we used each of these pieces to create a rectangle, and we found the areas of those rectangles, and we added them all up. So how did we create these rectangles. Well, the way we created these rectangles was to select a point in the interval, draw a line up to the curve, and then use that as the height of the rectangle. And you can use any point in the interval you want. And as the midpoint rule is a pretty uh, self-explanatory name, the midpoint rule says, well, if we select the point in the middle of the interval, it will usually give us a better result than if we select a point far in either direction to the left or the right. And that's the midpoint rule. So if I wanted to try to put it more formally, we have an integral from A to B of f of x dx, step one, split the interval from A to B into pieces. And in situations where you might want to use the midpoint rule, you're going to get to decide how big or how small these pieces are. So in practice, these pieces are usually going to be equal in size. So you have a bunch of pieces now. By tradition, we normally call, say, okay, we'll start at x zero, then the end of the first piece will be x1, the end of the second piece will be x2, and so on. So we have a bunch of pieces that look like this. 
x sub i comma x sub i plus one. For each of these pieces, we take the midpoint Mathematically, if you want to know the value between two numbers, it's the average of those numbers. Sorry, I know it's kind of easier for me to annotate the white more than for you to annotate those notes. N is reserved here for the number of pieces. And if these pieces are going to be equal size, that size is going to be B minus A divided by N. We're not doing anything fancy here. B minus A is the length of the entire interval. We're splitting it into N pieces. And let's give that a name. Let's call it Delta X. And from here, our approximation that the integral is about the sum of f evaluated at these midpoints times, don't need an i there, times delta x. So from a from a pedagogical point of view, the sad thing about this material, it's so important. And I mean, the examples are not interesting. I mean, maybe that's not something I'm supposed to say out loud, but let's, let's do an example. Let's estimate the integral from one to two of the sine of one over x, an integral I said we can't take by hand. And let's use n equals six. So we're going from one to two and we're letting n be six. Let's start by finding delta x. B minus a divided by n is one sixth. And this is going to go smoother if we get a common denominator. Two is 12 sixths, one is six sixths. So we'll start by dividing this interval into equal sizes. We start with six sixths, then seven sixths, eight, nine, ten, eleven, and we end at twelve. And now to use the midpoint rule. We need these midpoints. 
So let's think it through. Midway between six fixed and seven six. Well, the average of those thirteen twelve. Then fifteen twelfths seventeen twelfths. So I'm not I don't need to find all of these averages because the midpoints are also equally distributed. So once I see that we're going from 13 to 15, that's two twelfths. We'll go from 15 to 17, another two twelfths. From 17 to 19, another two twelfths. From 19 to 21, let me fix that. And from 21 to 23. And two is 24 twelfths. So this looks, wait, no. I don't like that. Maybe I do six, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, six. 2 minus 1 over 6 is 1 6. Then we start 6, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 6 is 2. So I like the 6. 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13 over 6 divided by 2 is 13 over 12. Then seven and eight, 15 over 12. Oh, no, I do like this. I'm, my mind is uh, throwing up um, error messages that are not great. This, now that I think about it, this is absolutely what I was expecting. So we have these numbers. We have this delta x. The midpoint rule says, OK, you take the function at the first number. Times delta x. You take the function, now this is an error, one divided by x, so one divided by 13 twelfths. Sorry if that's tiny, times one six, plus, the sign evaluated at the second number times one sixth plus, and we keep going until we reach twenty three twelfths. Uh, 
prime as one sixth. And we can and probably should pull a one sixth out and maybe do just a little simplification here. Now to our calculator, and the reason I said that this material, it's hard to give really fascinating examples, is just that these examples all end plugging stuff into our calculator, and it always takes a while, and we just have to be careful not to make mistakes. So we want a one sixth out front. Then we want the sign of twelve thirteenths. Plus the sign of what's going up? Is it twelve fifteen? 12 fifteenths, thank you. So at this point, we can hopefully, I mean, this pattern, the denominator is going to keep going up by one. Let's see. We want to stop at 23, so one more to go. So there's our estimation for this integral using the midpoint rule. And that's just out of curiosity, but also to check our work. We're trying to estimate this. We're doing it by hand, like it's the 1800s, or I guess sort of by hand, obviously we used our calculator. Let's see what, what more advanced technology gives us from one to two of the sign. So one divided by X. So you absolutely do not need to know what this C1 and this C2 is, which is my diplomatic way of saying that I have no idea what those are. But we can see our decimal approximation. Maybe, maybe you can't really see it from where you're sitting. 0.63256. Wrong share. 0.632. So using the midpoint rule with um, six rectangles, gave us the first three digits correct. And I mean, it was kind of tedious to do by hand, but you can well imagine that if you have a computer program, I wonder if, 
Midpoint through online. An online calculator. Okay, let's see if this is going to work. A sine of one divided by x from one to two, and we used six rectangles. Uh, apologies for the horrible ads. Come on, you're making a fool of me. Okay, here we go. So it tells us, you know, here are the various intervals. And it gives us this using six rectangles. And again, I trust I'm not going to be made a fool of when I say that Basically, any computer technology could significantly up the number of rectangles without adding a lot of work. Scroll down. So now I've told it I want to use 20 rectangles. And it uh, sorry, sharing the wrong thing, and it completely breaks. Thank you for making a fool of me after all. I don't know why. I think it's because you went on the interval from one to three instead of one to two. Ah. Thank you. Human error. I should not break blame my tools for my own error. Let's try that again. Here we go. 0. 0.6325346 And now what I want to do, well, I can't because I quit Wolfram Alpha. But the point is that, um, you know, because these textbooks are all like 30 years old, um, the homework exercises are always like, use your, do, do this approximation by hand using four rectangles or whatever. And I think that probably makes this material seem very tedious, but of course, these things are done not by hand in any real world setting. What time is it? It's 9.30. Okay, so there are three rules we should talk about. The second one we'll talk about today. The third rule we'll talk about tomorrow is how I imagine this will work. The trapezoidal rule. So when we introduce integrals, we introduce them using rectangles. We've got this region, we want to approximate it, we'll approximate it using rectangles. But 
Rectangles aren't magical. The only thing about rectangles is that we know how to take their area. And obviously that's significant because the way this process works is that we can create rectangles and then we find those areas and add them up. But any shape whose area we know how to find could work. And the trapezoidal rule says that if we want to estimate the area under a curve, then instead of using rectangles, we could use shapes like that, trapezoids. And I mean, we probably don't remember off the top of our heads how to find the area of a trapezoid, but that's something we can look up. And we see Using trapezoids, does a really good job, by and large, of approximating this curve. I mean, there are little errors here and there, but there's really only one place in the beginning where we see a significant difference between the um, trapezoids and the curve. So using trapezoids is better than using rectangles in the following sense. You have a choose between using N rectangles. Or N trapezoids the trapezoids will usually give a better approximation and again I feel like you know this isn't something I'm going to try to prove formally But if we just take a look, at using rectangles here, versus using trapezoids,
I mean, I think it's probably visually clear that the trapezoids are doing a better job. Of course, if we're going to use trapezoids, we need to be able to find the area of a trapezoid. I mean, that's the point of all of this. We find the areas and we add them up and we get an approximation of the real area. And fortunately, the area of a trapezoid is not bad. It's actually kind of intuitive. For a rectangle, the area is the base times the height. Here, we don't have a height. We have a smaller height and a bigger height. So the area of the rectangle, her, the area of the trapezoid, sorry, turns out to be the base times the average of the bigger and the smaller heights. So we can, now that we know how to find the area of a trapezoid, we can use the trapezoidal rule the trapezoidal rule really shines um, in two cases. Um, in a purely mathematical, no word problem, just looking at a form to the type case, the trapezoidal rule becomes really nice if your rectangles all have the same width. And I mean, this is true for the midpoint rule as well. The midpoint rule becomes a huge hassle if your intervals are different lengths. When I was using the midpoint rule, I mean, I went from 13 to 15, and then 17, 19, 21, 23. Because of the equal widths, once I saw that we're going up twice from 13 to 15, I said, okay, we'll go up twice again from 15 to 17, up twice again from 17 to 19, and so on. If we had different widths, it wouldn't work that way. You'd have to find each of the midpoints manually by averaging. But the trapezoidal rule especially becomes nice if we have this um, situation. So we've got this interval, we've cut it into pieces, x0, x1, x2, and this last piece will be xn. The midpoint rule says, not the midpoint rule, the trapezoidal rule says, the integral from A to B of f of x dx 
is approximately delta x divided by two. And now this formula is a little goofy. We'll start with f of x zero. After f of x zero, we're going to start chucking twos in. Two times f of x one, two times f of x two, two times f of x three. So we'll have these f's with twos attached to them. until we get to the very end when we'll just have f of x sub n without any two. So there's the trapezoidal root. And again, this form of the requires all of the intervals to be equal lengths. Um, so that we just have this delta x. And where this formula comes from, um, now it comes from here. Let me... expand this picture a little. x sub 0, x sub 1, x sub 2, x sub 3. So this is f of x sub 0, f of x sub 1, f of x sub 2, and f of x sub three. And this is delta x, delta x, delta x. So we find the area of the first trapezoid, it's delta x over two times f, of x sub zero plus f of x sub one. You see what I've done here is take this one half and moved it under the base. So what about the second trapezoid? Now it's delta x over two times, I said x sub one, but sometimes my hand just does strange things. The second trapezoid, again, we take that one half and we move it under the base. And you see that x sub one shows up again. This x, this f of x sub one is appearing as the right side of the first trapezoid and as the left side of the second trapezoid. So it shows up twice. Then we find the area of the third trapezoid. And we see this x sub two shows up again. This x sub two is showing up twice because this is both the right side of the second trapezoid and the left side of the third trapezoid.
So we can pull out this delta x over two. And then what will we have left? We'll have a single f of x sub zero. f of x sub zero only shows up once. We'll have a single f of x sub three. f of x sub three only shows up twice. But f of x sub one shows up two times. So that's where that two comes from. And f of x sub two shows up two times. Everything shows up two times except for the first and the last number. Okay, no time to finish the trapezoidal rule after all. But just looking ahead slightly, the trapezoidal rule gets used a lot in real world situations where we just have lists of data and we want an integral. Like imagine you're, you're in a hospital and you're monitoring a patient. You're, um, so you take the readings of this patient every hour, let's say. So you know what the patient's vital signs are at midnight and at 1 a.m. and at 2 a.m. and at 3 a.m. and 4 a.m. and so forth. And now we need, want to find the area under the curve, only we don't have a curve. We just have a bunch of points. The traditional way to do this is to say, well, okay, let's just pretend that this function is linear, piecewise linear. And then we can find the area under the curve using the trapezoidal. More details tomorrow. Um, oh, and we actually did manage to just um, finish on top.